everybody got their mirrors situated next to them so I can see myself as I talk this morning? Because we know that going through this book, that is exactly what it feels like. And I am dealing with that all week long. Let me tell you, slap in the face after slap in the face from the wonderful book of James. Last week, we started in this series, and we did our process of going back to school with James. And we started with primary education, our reading, writing, and arithmetic. And from that, we discovered through the hated study of math, a equation that is the foundation for our education in James. This is what everything is set upon. Our primary education sets a foundation for us to be able to learn everything else. And that equation is this, that perseverance plus action multiplied by understanding equals a faithful way of life. So we completed primary education, and James has set us up to move on now to enroll in two more classes that are our secondary education. And the first one of those is etiquette class. And everybody's kind of going, what? Not a typical subject that we would see in school, I know. And not necessarily one that you might really think of, like verbally as something within the church. But the funny thing is, is I'm not necessarily talking about etiquette this morning in the in the sense that we think about it when we apply it to life, okay? This isn't about, well, you use the fork on the left for your salad and the one up top is dessert. And I, no, uh -uh. did any of us actually have to go through any of that? Did any of you actually go through etiquette training when it came to that? Good Lord, I cannot believe my wife is one raising her hand on that. <clears throat> All right, I'm not gonna go there. Um, so James actually takes the idea of etiquette and I believe he gives us a very invaluable lesson that we can use that is central to the concepts and the ideas of the mission of God's church. Now hear that. Think about that for a second, okay? The mission of God's church. That's exactly what it is. Many times we have mission statements ourselves, but a good friend of mine put it this way, and I think this is, I think this is the way that we need to look at it. The church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. All right? The church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. We're all on the same page with what we're supposed to be doing here. We should all be on the same page with what we're doing because we really only have that one mission. That mission is really to do this. Make fully devoted followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. That's it. That is God's mission for us. He wants to see us pour into other people. And believe it or not, etiquette itself will play a huge role in that process. See if you can stay with me here. Church, when we come together in this place, it's meant to be a place where we belong, right? It's not a club or a society or a clique of people that are some sort of extra special thing to be a part of. That's not, that's not the attitude of the atmosphere that we want to convey, this is an open door place. It's an open invitation place. We welcome anyone and everyone who wants to come in in the love of Jesus. Even Jesus himself said what? Come as you are. This is, this is not necessarily supposed to be a place for healthy people. This is a hospital. This is where we take care of people and we take care of each other. And Really, it, it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be some focus on, on, on the aspect of what your past is or anything of that nature. Jesus met people right where they were at, where you should meet people right where they are at. The focal point and the idea of, of what we should be doing is actually, it should be focused that when we walk in these doors, no matter who walks in these doors, it's where we are right now and the choices we're going to make going forward. That's what matters. Not what's behind, where we're at right now and how that's going to affect the choices moving forward. I would say there is, a, there is one prerequisite, though. There's one prerequisite to coming into church. There's one prerequisite. That prerequisite is this. No perfect people allowed. Not real hard to fulfill, is it? Any of us in here go, oh, no, 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 I'm good. Thank you, nobody, for even making a joke of raising your hand on that one. All right. It's really not hard to fulfill. And James is really calling us out on this. He's calling us out against this idea. See, we're supposed to have the right etiquette. 
And what James is doing is he's saying, you got to be careful in this because the problem is a lot of us fall into sin here. And we don't even realize that we fall into sin here. What James is calling us out in the class of etiquette is he's calling us out on the sin of favoritism. He begins to attack us on the idea of showing partiality when we should not be showing partiality, especially when it comes to people. In any sense, no matter what, and especially within the church, it is not a good idea to fall into this. So let's go to the text. Let's see where we're at. Starting in James, verse 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 1. Here we go. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Okay, straightforward, right to the point, starting it out, show no partiality. You don't show partiality because you're holding to the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. But look first at how he describes him. He says, the Lord of glory. James is getting to a very direct point here. He is making a distinction. He is separating the concept here. We don't show partiality because we're not supposed to. But there is a distinction still made. But that distinction is not between two men. It's not about the idea. He's saying you don't show partiality, okay? There's nothing between you. But hey, we serve the Lord of glory. There is a distinction there. The distinction is that there is a separation and there is a difference between he who is up there and us who sit down here. That is for sure. There is a distinction there. But there should not be a distinction between me and Donnie. Or between Elaine and Elise, or between Bill and John. There's no distinction there. And there shouldn't be as we hold to the faith. If we're holding to that faithful way of life, you're going to hear things that are tied into that equation through this entire morning. That's why it's the foundation of our education. We really don't have the right to give a distinction to more than that, or it ends up leading to that sin of favoritism and partiality. What we can and what we should favor is God himself and what he desires for us in our life. That we should favor. That we should be prioritizing. That we should be showing partiality to over what society desires from us. As we move on, verses 2 through 4, for if a man is wearing a gold ring and fine clothing and he comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James really paints a really strong word picture here. He really puts this into a context and, and makes us see what's really going on when we're showing this partiality. We struggle with all of society's difficulties and what they claim is our priority, what, what we should value over other things, that there is a higher value to certain things and less value to certain things. And so we're quick to judge instead of showing the love and mercy of Christ that we have been shown, that we are not given to a partiality when it comes to how God looks at us. But James is saying you can't judge in that way. You can't judge people based on a status. We're not in a position to decide a level of importance when it comes to the different people that we come in contact with. We're not given the authority. See, this is the distinction between God and us. We're not given the authority to determine the status based on what, person, what one person may have and what another person has. But here's the question. Why do we tend then to do that? Why is it that we tend to show favoritism or show partiality in those ways, giving attention to certain people rather than other people? You know, it's funny how it's just like a catch-22 situation. The whole reason we do that is because we want their favor in return. We show those people, we give attention to those people that we think are more important or that are higher than us or have the connection. We do that because we want to be able to get on the inside over there. That's going to help us go farther. That's going to help us do more. Here's the heart issue on this. We're going to do a few of these throughout the morning. Heart check. Whose favor should we really desire? 
There's a second part connected to that one. Whose example should we follow? Verse 5, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? James is kind of asking a lot of rhetorical questions here. We know the answers. We don't want to give the answers. And he's clarifying here. Jesus' attention was completely opposite of what our etiquette usually desires according to society in our lives. To be the church, we got to be turning our attention completely to those in need. To be the church, we have to flip-flop the idea of what we're thinking is going to get us ahead. And it really doesn't matter what that need is. It doesn't matter if it's physical, emotional, spiritual. We need eyesight so that we can better get into our insight and learn to understand on a greater level. There's the equation again. Pers Perseverance plus action times what? Understanding. We've got to understand what's in there if we're going to apply it properly. There's a parable from Jesus in the book of Luke, and it shows the idea of poor etiquette on one side and proper etiquette on another. This is a... <laughs> Ouch. Luke 14, 16 to 24. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have a married wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. I love this. As, as, as much of a beatdown as this may be, I love this because this is how I believe we should be viewing things in the church. I believe the church as a whole needs to take this as a picture of application on a greater level, especially with all the distractions we have in today's society. Everything that will pull us away from the priorities of what really should be most important to our hearts and to our lives. We have the opportunity to be a part of what I call the beggar's kingdom. Donald Miller, author and speaker, in his book, Blue Like Jazz, he said this, It is better to live in a beggar's kingdom than in a proud man's delusion. I, <coughs> I could get in trouble here. When we think about this, this guy invites, invites these people who are of a status, of, of a place in which they, are, they should be honored. Like he's going, I, I want you to come. This is, this is a man of status. Obviously, there's a picture here of Jesus and us. I'll get to that. This is a man of status, and he's inviting these people saying, I want you to come and honor me by being here. And these people make excuses not to come. And so he tells his servants, go out, the blind, the crippled, the lame, these people that have nothing, bring them in. Because if those guys aren't going to come, I don't care. I prepared this feast and people are going to come. People are going to be here and we are going to share in this. And we are going to enjoy this. This will not go to waste. Well, it's been done, but we still got space. Mm. Go out everywhere you can. Find anybody. I don't care who. Bring them in. How many of us are making excuses? How many of us spend time in our lives going, this is where I'm going to get in trouble? Well, my kids got sports games, so I can't be there. All my friends got this party that I got to go to, I can't be there. Oh, well, this, this came up and and I, I really just feel like that that's more important right now. 
it's not that things are bad in our lives, guys. It's not that we don't have awesome things that we can be a part of and things that we want to do with our families, with our kids, with our friends. But we have to be really, really careful that we're not making excuses to get away from the priorities and, and favoring and showing partiality to the things that don't get us anywhere in our faith. We have to be careful to make sure that our priorities and, and the things that are going to grow us better in our faith are going to be at the forefront. Because like I said, the one thing that, that we can favor, the one thing you can show partiality to that, that isn't bad is to God and his desires for our lives. That's okay. I'll stop there so that I don't get in more trouble about it. James does call us out on this. In verses 6 through 9, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. James is not making this some small concept. He's saying this is a big deal. He calls out the partiality at this point. Why would you choose those who cause you trouble? Why follow those whose influence is built on a platform that ends up contradicting the faith that you claim to have? And here James basically says, if you're doing that, you're no better than them. Because those people themselves, they're showing favoritism. They're showing partiality in a way. So if you choose to try to work your way toward them, even though they bring you down, you're not doing anything better than they are. You're stuck in that same rut. You're stuck in that same path. You're not any different. It's great that you love people no matter what. That's awesome. You can love the poor people, love the rich people, love the people out there, love the people in here. You can do that. That's fantastic. You're doing well if you love everyone. But if you're showing favor to one and not another, it ends up just being a total epic fail. James says this, verses 10 to 12, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. There is a lot in those three verses. And James' example is straightforward. That no matter what, you got to follow the whole mission of Christ, okay? There's no concept out there of being a part-time Christian. We don't serve a part-time Jesus. You can't put God in a box and make it your comfort zone with what you do and what you don't. On top of that, James lays out the example regarding this sin of improper etiquette by very bluntly conveying that sin is still sin. We have to stop looking at sin in the church. We have to stop looking at it from a skyscraper standpoint. We tend to stand and look and we see this. See, God sees this. It's a bird's eye view. We have to start looking at it like that. Because so many of us, this is the place where we fall into the worst kind of favoritism and partiality. Is when we judge the sin that is in other people. Not necessarily status or, or place in society or anything like that. It's when we judge the sin like, well, their sin isn't as bad as mine. We get a holier than thou mentality when we think about that. Let me blow your minds for a second on this, okay? Anybody in here over the past week told somebody just the smallest of white lies? It wasn't, you know, or, you know, how I would put it, it didn't fully convey the truth. How many of you know at some point during this past week you 
definitely said or did something that was not necessarily along the lines of proper attitude. Here's, here's an interesting for you. We all know that we all battle with sin every day. Sin is sin is sin. God's bird's eye view, that guy that's somewhere in a federal prison on death row because he murdered and raped six women, we're no better than he is. We're no better. Sin is sin is sin. It doesn't matter what it is. There is no sin greater than another save one. But I'm not going to go into a big theological thing on that. I could go a whole nother sermon on that, trust me. James said, if you, if you don't, he says, if you don't murder, but you commit adultery, you're still in sin. Or if you commit adultery, but you don't murder, you're still in sin, okay? It's like arguing your way out of a speeding ticket by doing this. Oh, officer, officer, I'm so sorry. I, I know I was speeding. I know I was speeding. But, you know, just so you know, I didn't run the stop sign. You still broke the law. You still did something that you shouldn't have. Sin is sin is sin. You can't pick and choose what part of God's word to follow and what parts not to. Jesus' style etiquette is all or nothing. It doesn't ask for perfection. It asks for sanctification through holiness, through a process of going to him daily, pursuing that faithful way of life, perseverance plus action, multiplied by understanding. But it's all or nothing. You're either pouring yourself into that process with him or you're not. We got to live and act like we know that we ourselves are going to stand before him in judgment at some point. Verse 12, speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. We got to get with the program. James alludes to a positive reinforcement. I mean, it doesn't always come across a positive reinforcement, but here it, there is a positive reinforcement to this in verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's how we get with the program. We were shown mercy in times, right? How many of us in here would raise our hands and say, I've never been shown mercy? Man, that's what I thought. We've been given mercy by God. Forgiveness in one of the most gigantic ways that we could possibly accept. And we are set free. We have freedom because of it. And therefore, we should be willing to do the same. We have to show mercy, though, as James said, if we expect to receive mercy for ourselves. The positive point, the reinforcement here, the thing that is such a blessing to us in the end is James is saying the reason that we show mercy is because we've given mercy. And the best part about that is that mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, all of a sudden, when we stand before that judgment and the law of liberty, we will have been shown mercy because we've accepted that. And if we show it, that judgment will go away because mercy will triumph over it. This concept of, of whether or not we get mercy, if we show mercy, it shouldn't be something that's a threat to be afraid of. James is just simply trying to get us to understand that if we fully and truly understand that the, that the gospel is real and we know how to live that and how to show that, then we understand how mercy triumphs over judgment. See, God didn't see our disgusting nature at times and just avoid us. God didn't look down on us and go, eh, gross, no. And it's like comedian and speaker Ken Davis. He said, when God created me, he said, we'll take a little bit of this. And we'll take a little bit of this. Oh, gross. But God didn't do that. God looked at us and he saw something more and he said, I can show mercy. And when I do, if you accept it, we can do something amazing. He embraced us. He sent his son to die for us. And if he can show that kind of mercy to us, we can show that mercy to other people. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. So that's etiquette. And as the bell rings, we move to our next class. 
Guys, this class title, it's for you. We're enrolling in our second one, shop class. How many guys are with me? Are the Tim Allen Grunt? Everybody know? Oh, 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 oh. Shop class, manly, tools, working with your hands. James 2.14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Somebody just want to slap me in the face? Seriously. James now is just reattacking a major theme he continues to bring up over and over and over again through these five chapters. Talking about it versus doing it. Hearing about it versus doing it. James is so crystal clear here in this question, it's honestly terrifying to a point. So let me present this. He's saying, what good are words with nothing to back them? What good are words if there's nothing to back them, and is that going to save you? Let me blow the idea of salvation out of the water here via James. <laughs> no. No. Words are worthless if you got nothing to back them. And no, it's not going to save you if you're just standing around doing nothing. You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? James explains, verses 15 through 17. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Okay, I'm going to illustrate this. Shop class. In shop, you build things, right? Most of the time, you're putting things together. You're building things, whether it's metal, whether it's wood. doesn't really matter, okay? Therefore, you've got pieces of different objects or items you would use to put stuff together. And you're going to have tools that are going to be necessary to be able to help you build and put that together so that you can complete a final product that becomes something useful. Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe it was a birdhouse, or I built a toolbox. Anybody else? What kind of stuff did you build? Did anybody in here actually take a shop class? Maybe not. My dad actually had a shop class in high school, and he built a lamp. And that lamp to this day actually still works, believe it or not. I'm going to use that as the example here. If you're building a lamp, okay, Let's just say you get, you get your parts for the lamp. You got your tools and your parts, okay? And you're ready to go, okay? Let me tell you, does this work? Hey, here, got you a lamp. Enjoy it. What good, what good does that do? Does it serve any purpose? Is it useful to them in any way? The parts have to be assembled. Things have to be put together. You need tools necessary to do so. And then you got to have electricity for it to work. How many of you in here have been down to Mexico? You've gone on the mission trip down to Mexico. Handful of people. I went, I've gone to the Dominican four times. i got some kids that I sponsor through an organization down there. And, and let me tell you, those of you who have been to Mexico on that trip, you'll understand this idea. What good does it do me if I go down on these trips, okay, and all I do is I meet these people, and I go into their homes, or I go to the schools where the kids are at, and all I do is give them happy thoughts. Hey, that's great. I'm sure another pair of shoes will come along when you need them. I know it's cold outside. Don't worry. I'm sure you'll find a jacket. There's no food in the refrigerator? God always provides. It'll happen. What? It's pointless. What, in, what, what good is that? I claim to have a faith in Jesus, but all I do is, is speak about it and tell people, oh, God's good. He'll provide. That's not to say that we're always going to be able to do something in every single situation ourselves, but it doesn't mean we can't find avenues beyond that within the scope of other people who are also called to help and be a part of this under their faith and work together to accomplish taking care of things. We can call, our Christian, call ourselves Christians all day long. Okay, We can speak it till we're blue in the face. 
But if nothing shows it, James flat out just says, guess what? It's dead. Dead. That means not a zip, zero, gone, kaput, non-existent, not there. It's like James going, guys, yeah, in your face. And what does it mean? It means if you have faith, but you have nothing to show for it, it's a moo point. Some people remember that. Some people don't. It's like a cow's opinion. Doesn't matter. It's moo. It's like, it's like buying a car for my kids one day when they're ready for a car. And I go down to the salvage yard and I buy a car that's in decent shape, but it doesn't have an engine in it. And I toss them the keys and go, there you go. It doesn't serve any purpose. And so becomes our faith. And that's what James is saying. Not, not that works saves you, but the faith that we claim that saves us, it has to be lived out in some manner, by some means. How else is anyone going to know that your faith is real or the product of it and what you speak of is actually existent if you don't in some way show them? James says some still argue. And you know what? In the church and in society, people still argue. That's great for you. You know, it's not just not really my cup of tea. That's not how I go about doing it. It's a very postmodern way of thinking. What's right for you may not be right for me, and what's right for me may not be right for you, but you know, that's okay. How many people, how many people have you met? How many people, you know, I'm good with my one hour in church every week. I'm fulfilling my duty. I show up, I stand up, I sing, I shake some hands, I put a check in the offering plate, I go home. I'm covered. God's got this. James fires back. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. That's another call out. That's great. All right. You talk about it all day long. All right. You can tell people about it all day long. I don't have to say a word. What I do, what I do will show my faith in Jesus. Go ahead and talk, James says. I'm going to show you I have faith. Heart check. Can you speak what James is speaking? Can you say, when people see my life, would they know that I believe in God? Do my actions, and not just my words, lead people to know that that faith is real and alive in my life? James begins to nail the coffin shut on us, too. This is, this is just... This is painful. Verse 19... Many of us are familiar with this verse, but we're going to put it into a real full context. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Many times we just think about this and go, yeah, you know, I believe in God, but even the, even the demons believe, okay? I mean, it's like belief is not that difficult for me because if the demons believe, I can believe. But that's what James is saying here. He's going, that's the problem. The God is one idea. It's from the Old Testament. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. yes. From the beginning, through the law, through the, through the creation of the new covenant, when Jesus fulfilled it, he didn't abolish it, he fulfilled it. Yes, God is one. That's great. But guess what? Even the demons believe that. Even the demons believe that. Whether, whether Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. The demons believe and understand that God is one. They actually shudder at the thought of it. It is terrifying to them at the thought of it. So what's supposed to differentiate us between the demons and, and us? It's the actions. It's what we do with it. We can have a fear of God. They have a fear of God. The difference is they refuse the transformation. They refuse the sanctification process. They refuse the call to action. James is saying you, don't, you talk and don't act? Great. If you talk and don't act, guess who you're equal with? The demon. I don't know about anybody else, but that hurts. That's painful. Problem is, apparently, whoever James was specifically speaking to at the time, they're still fighting with him over this. I don't get it. By this point, I'm going, gotcha, please stop. I'm sorry, please stop. And James says in verse 20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? He's like, fine. 
You don't get this still? You don't understand you're on par with demons if you don't put it to action? All right, we'll take it farther. In 21 through 25, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, that faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So Abraham, he showed his belief through his work. It was counted him as righteousness. He didn't just talk about it. He showed it so far that he was going to sacrifice his only beloved son. How many of us in here would go, yep, I could do that. I could take my son out and sacrifice him to God. I'm pretty sure that I'd be going, God, there's got to be another way. No, uh -uh. I'm going to argue with this. I'm going to argue until I'm blue in the face. And that's kind of what they did here. Well, of course, Abraham. I mean, obviously. I mean, he's the father of our nation. I mean, come on. What do you want us to do? Okay, fine. So I picked a bad example there. All right, I'll give you another one. You see, that person is just... Or, and in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? He's going, okay, Abraham, the father of the nation. All right, yeah. So he's a God guy. Rahab. You want another one? I'll give you a powerful one. Rahab, she's a prostitute. She's not of this nation. But was there not justification that she had found faith in something greater than what she was living in because she saved the lives of these men of God who were spying upon the city? Our actions, our works, they're not seen as a justification of our salvation but they are a justification of the faith that we claim is our salvation. James gives a killer illustration to end this in verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. There it is again. Faith without works is dead. When we die, man, we're dead. When our body's gone, when the spirit's gone, gone. Gone. That's how he is painting this for us. That's what he's saying. He's saying, guys, when you're alive and you can live in that faith and you can show it, if you don't do that, you're already dead. You got no actions to back the talk. Dead. Just like the physical body separated from the spirit. Dead. Heart check. Are you alive? Or are you dead? It's pretty amazing to me how these two classes end up actually intertwining each other so well. Our works are actions with other people, and how our etiquette plays out in that, it's, it's found in how we put the pieces of our faith together in shop class and work them out. Scripture even says that we're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Even the demons believe and shudder. The difference is the transformation of us being sanctified and called to action, to do something about it. James is giving a twofold challenge here through this. Number one, get with the program. Get with the program. What are your priorities? How are you going to align the priorities in your life? And two, employ an action to your faith. Don't be hearers only. Do what it says. And think about the equation. Always got to have that foundation, because if we apply that equation, then it helps us pass these two classes as well. If our perseverance and actions, coupled with our understanding, produces a faithful way of life, then we are getting with the program, and our faith will be alive in action. So you got to be challenged to apply that equation in a new level here, now that we've done primary education and secondary education. We've got to challenge ourselves each and every day to wake up and let Jesus breathe life into the faith that we claim to have. We start there. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. If we're seeking him first each and every day, guess what? He's going to provide opportunities for you to bring to action the faith that you claim to have. Here, do an, do an evaluation. Right here, right now, I'm going to challenge you to do an evaluation where you're sitting, Okay? Nobody be smacking your neighbor on this, okay? This is not what this is about. Don't give anybody a look, okay? Keep this to yourself. 
Think about what you heard last week when we talked about primary education. Now, think through the week that you just went through leading up to today. Were there any actions to your faith in the past week that led up to today, to the secondary education? Was the primary education applied and done during the week? Because if you can't think of anything, there may be a greater evaluation yet to be done. Because based on what God's done for us, we got to choose to live our life without partiality, showing mercy to those that the world has rejected, and allow our faith to produce fruit. We got to let God open our eyes each and every day. Take away the delusional way of living so that we can join together to be the church at a greater level, to come alive in our faith, and to choose to live in the beggar's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, I can't help but feel that two by four to the back of the head like with every page turn. We're called to do something about this. Through James and your word, it says if we don't, we're dead. I'm pretty sure just about every person in here would say, God, I don't want to be dead to you. I want to be alive in you, because if I'm alive in you, then people are going to see that I'm alive in you, and they're going to question why there's a difference. God, transform us. That sanctifying grace, that mercy that you've shown to us, may we take that and show that to others, and in doing so, make our faith come alive. And that action, that action will lead others to investigate and want to be in the same place. And then, Father, we can turn around and point all the glory back to you. May we choose not to live in a prideful delusion but to join you at your table in the beggar's kingdom. At the greatest meal we could possibly want to eat. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Yeah.